temptation to mankind today, and it's still the most important question when Jesus turned and looked into the disciples' faces and said, Who do you say that I am? And Peter said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, which meant you're the, you're the answer to the uh, prophecy of the Old Testament. You're the promised one of God. You're the one, the seed of Abraham, uh, the seed of, I mean, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David. You're the one we've been looking for. And that's still the importance of it today. And so in, Sam, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, David wanted to build a, uh, a house, uh, a temple to God. And God said, no, you can't, uh, you can't build a house. But in verse 11, we start with what the, the prophet Nathan is the one doing the talking. Because in verse 1, uh, God, uh, David had told uh, Nathan that he wanted to build a house. And Nathan said, go do what, all that your heart desires. But that night in a vision, God spoke to Nathan and said, no, he's not to build a house. You go tell him these words. And so here in verse 11, the prophet Nathan is speaking to David about what God told him to tell David. Verse 11, since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused you to rest from all your enemies, also the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. Verse 13 is a key verse. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish his throne of his kingdom forever. That's a pretty good statement for a king to hear. No other king ever expected, I don't think, his lineage to go on forever. And God is telling David, your kingdom is going to go on forever. Verse 14, and he's, talking about, he's saying it'll be through your son. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. In verse 17 and 18, according to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David, then King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? That's how hearing from God should make us feel and react. When Nathan had come before David and said, Here's what God has told me, that God is about to establish your kingdom forever. He, he went on to talk in those first verses about taking him from the sheepfold, about the time that he was nothing, and making him not only a king, but a king with a forever lineage. A eternal kingdom was going to come from the lineage of David, and of course we know that to be Jesus Christ. And that covenant also, as Matthew points out, goes back to Abraham as he called Abraham up out of a land of idol worship. And he said to Abraham, as the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea, I'm going to make your offspring that way. And, I'm going to, and, and through your lineage, you're going to be a, a blessing to all the world, to all the nations. And, of course, we know that to be the lineage of which Jesus Christ was born, that all the nations of the world would be blessed through Jesus Christ. I want to read verse 18 again. Look at verse 18. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord. And he said, Who am I? And I think this is part of the whole scenario that later God could say, David was a man after my own heart. David was a man who recognized that he was nothing. 
And with that, David also recognized the need for repentance later on when he did sin so, so greatly. Psalms 51 is a psalm David wrote that he just pours his heart out to God. And how great I, sin- I, I have sinned against you, God. Adultery with Bathsheba put her husband Uriah up on the front lines and told the rest of the army to withdraw and leave him facing the army by himself. So he just as well as killed him himself. So guilty of adultery and guilty of murder, and yet he said, didn't say my sin was against Bathsheba nor my sin against Uriah. He said, but, oh, God, my sin has been against you. And so we find him now sitting before the Lord, and he's just said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? I want to fast forward a thousand years. And when we fast forward a thousand years, we find Jesus in the upper room. I mean almost exactly a thousand years. And we find Jesus in the upper room, and he's observing the last Passover. And he lifts the last cup of the Passover meal, which is the cup of blessing. And as he lifts lifts the last cup of the Passover meal, Luke records this in 2220. This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you God made a Davidic covenant we call it and the Davidic covenant was that David through your posterity all the nations of the world be blessed your kingdom will last forever and Jesus Christ born of the lineage of David is there looking in the faces of now 11 disciples Judas has just left. Jesus knew why. And Jesus is looking at the 11 disciples of whom the church is represented. These are the 11 men he's leaving. He's personally taught them. They're going to take the message of Jesus to the world. And Jesus says, here's a new covenant, and it's poured out for you. And we were represented there that day, too. All that would follow the message of the disciples and would follow the message of Jesus Christ. We live in the New Testament. We call it a New Testament, an Old Testament, a New Testament. But another, uh, the Latin word is covenant. That's where we get the word covenant. It's a new covenant, an old covenant, a new covenant. And the new covenant is made for you and I this morning. So I want to go back to verse 18 a third time. I want you to look at verse 18. Then put your name right there. Then we went in and sat before the Lord. We had the privilege. We had the invitation to go in and sit in the presence of Almighty God. And we went in and sat before the Lord after this new covenant. And we said, Who am I, O Lord God? Who am I? Put your name. I think it's the exact statement. David had a covenant made. And you and I have a covenant a promise made by God that through the blood of Jesus Christ we were welcome into the presence of God. Nothing we could bring, nothing we could earn, nothing we could deserve, nothing except through the blood of the new covenant. You and I have been welcomed and invited into the presence of a holy God. And our reaction must be, who am I, O Lord God? What is my house that you've brought me this far? How is it I deserve heaven this morning? And of course, in and of yourselves, you do not deserve heaven this morning. It is the free gift of of a gracious God 
who held up a cup and said, this cup represents my blood poured out for you. And God, the Son, died in our behalf. Let's go on, verse 19, because what David pours out his heart here, I want you to see it, it as your prayer as David prays. Verse 19, and yet this was a small thing in your sight, meaning God easily promoted David, and even, uh, even with Christ's death, Paul points it out that, that Jesus himself did not clutch or did not grasp to his own deity, but laid it aside to come to earth to be born a man, and not only a man, but a servant, so that you and I could identify with him and then identify with his death and his resurrection. O oh Lord God, you have also spoken of your servant's house for a great, for a great while to come. Is this the matter of man, O oh Lord God? I think David realized, okay, he, he just made me a pretty big promise, which means my lineage, in fact, mankind is going to go on for a while. Verse 20, now what more can David say to you? For you, Lord God, know your servant. For your word's sake and according to your own heart, you have done all these great things to make your servant know them. Therefore, you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you. He's just pouring his heart out to him. None is there, nor is there any God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people, like Israel? Who is like the church today? If we, just, if we look at the, the two covenants side by side, who is like your, your bride today, Jesus Christ? Who's like the church the one nation on the earth today whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make for himself a name and to do for yourself great and awesome deeds for your land before your people, whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, the nations, and their gods. For you have made your people Israel your very own people forever. And you, Lord, have become their God. We could insert the church in there because we're on the new covenant looking back. They're in the Old Covenant, but the similarities are, are basically identical. Verse 25, Now, O Lord God, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as you have said. So let your name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God over Israel. And let the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, have revealed this to your servant. See, David didn't dream it up. He's saying, you're the one that made the covenant. You're the one that brought this up, that, that you're going to build, build a house. So your servant saying, I will build you a house. Therefore, your servant has found in his heart to pray this prayer to you. And now, O oh Lord God, you are God, and your words are true, and you have promised this goodness to your servant. Now, therefore, let it please you to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever before you, for you, O oh Lord God, have spoken it, and with your blessings, let the house of your servant be blessed forever. Now, that's a covenant. That's a covenant to do David good all the days of his life and all the years forever that the lineage of David would go on forever. And, of course, Jesus Christ became not just a king, but the king of kings and Lord of lords. Well, in a message on a similar note, it wasn't in from this same passage, but in studying for this passage, I ran across... I'm going to use John Piper's opening and closing because he just does, does such a good job of, of bringing the covenant uh, into our lives today that we can see that God means good for us. Do you believe that God means good for you? I'm reading a book, and the first three words are, Life is Difficult. Any testimonies out there? 
Life's just difficult, isn't it? But the first paragraph, he goes on to say, if you'll own that, if you'll truly own that life is difficult, it's no longer difficult because you know that's the standard by which everybody lives. We get to thinking that it's only me going through all of this, and that's where we moan and groan and, and all of that. But if we realize sin is in the world, life is difficult, but God means good by us and through us and in us, and maybe the difficulty is only to see how we're going to react to the difficulties so that it builds character and it builds faith. And we can look back on it and see how we grew through that particular time. That we indeed might be then a blessing to someone else later down the line. The reason we study the covenants is because in them we see the biblical proof that God's job description, it's one of the reasons I'm reading this, I'd never thought of it in this term. He's going to talk about jo God's personal job description. Have you ever stopped and considered that, that God's got on his desk his own job description? I don't know if that's exactly how it happens, but just food for thought. We study the covenants to see a biblical proof that God's job description does indeed include the responsibility. He's got responsibilities on his job description, and it includes the responsibility to withhold no good thing from those who walk uprightly and to work for those who wait for him and to turn every strip throat, strip clutch, and stinging put down for our eternal good. That's what I would offer as the definition of God's covenants. When God makes a covenant, he reveals his own job description and signs it. In almost every case, he comes to the covenant partner, lays his job description out, and says, This is how I will work for you. With all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength, if you will love me as I am, cleave to me and trust me to keep my word. The reason that I say uh, almost every case is that, in le and in the, that at least in one case, a covenant was made with no condition. That was the one made with Noah. The job description God writes for himself is never again to wipe out the world by a flood, but to preserve the course of nature until the very end. The reason we know this covenant has no conditions attached is that God made it with animals as well as man. In fact, Genesis 9, 12 says, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you. You can't require faith of a frog. All you can do to the frog is say, Mr. Frog, here is what I plan to do for you. So that's the nature uh, of covenants that God is saying, here's what I'm going to do for you, and he signs it. Has he kept, is he a God who normally keeps his promises? Yes, indeed he is. That's why we look at all the covenants through the Old Testament, and we come to the covenant of the New Testament, and we know that God's going to keep his covenant. But in every other covenant which God makes, he presents his job description, and he tells his covenant partner that he only works for clients who trust him and who do the sorts of things you do when you trust somebody to take care of you. And then he jumps fast forward into the or I'm going to, there's a lot more of the message for him, but what I want us to look at this morning is the new covenant. The mission of the church today is to submit ourselves to the son of David. That's why I wanted us to compare the Davidic covenant to the new covenant. I wanted us to see in ourselves that God has made a covenant with his people today, the church. And the mission of the church today is to to submit ourselves to the Son of David, who right now rules invisibly from heaven until he puts every enemy under his feet. 
And our mission is to announce the good news to people in every neighborhood, in every nation, that they can be happy subjects of Christ's kingdom forever if they transfer their allegiance from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of Christ. Now let's think for a minute. We are talking about covenants. We are talking about a kingdom that God promised to David would last forever. And then in this passage, we, we fast forward to the time of Christ. Christ often spoke of a kingdom. And then in giving his uh, life's blood and holding up the cup, he said, I'm giving you a, a new covenant, and it's in my blood. And so let's just think for a moment about kingdom. We don't really talk about kingdoms today, but back in the day of, of England and when there were kings and kingdoms and everybody was riding horseback and you had the, the uh, uh, what did you have, the, the main guys that was, Gina, who was the, the knights, there you go, I for, forgot that word. You have the knights, you have all this going on out in the kingdom. Let's suppose you had a kingdom where people were starving to death. I mean, where they barely had enough food to, to eat once every other day or so. And it was always doom and gloomy, and the sun didn't shine. I mean, we just, just picture about as dark a scene as you could picture. And then you go through the gate, and you've got a kingdom with the sun shining brightly. Everybody's got a banquet feast in front of them. Everybody's happy, and yet you walk around with the same attitude that you had when you were back in the old kingdom. You would only eat once every day or two. You would gripe and complain about everything around you. In fact, the new kingdom just wasn't doing it for you. You were still living just like you were in the old kingdom. Now, wouldn't that be the height of stupidity? Wouldn't that be pretty stupid to be in a new kingdom and still live like you was in the old kingdom? Do you reckon there's a, there's a message in that for us today? Folks, we're living in the new kingdom. We have went through the narrow gate. We have understood the new covenant. That God means good for us. Not just by and by, but now and now. I've come to give you life, and life now, and life everlastingly, is what Jesus said himself. The thief comes but to steal and to destroy and kill. He's, just the, he's, he's ruler over the kingdom out here of darkness. And you've passed from that kingdom, and you're now in this kingdom. And here's what the rules are in this kingdom. Tell everybody else. Tell everybody else about the, the new king you have. Tell everybody else how glorious the new kingdom is. And our mission is to announce the good news to people in every neighborhood, every nation, that they can be happy subjects of Christ's kingdom forever if they transfer their allegiance from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of Christ. Brother Jerry last week showed the testimony of Darlene Carey, and I think you were probably struck by that testimony. And at one point in there, she talked about having given up her rights. She realized she had no rights. So now I'm going to ask you a question. Do you want to stay out in this kingdom and have your rights? Eat every other day. Live in doom and gloom. But you got your rights. Or do you want to be over in this kingdom where you're at a banquet table every day and everything God is blessing you, but you have to give up your rights to, to get in there? In other words, you have to take the allegiance of the new king of the new kingdom. And here's what he goes on to say. To put it another way, personal holiness means learning the attitudes and customs of a new kingdom, the kingdom of Christ. 
And personal evangelism means telling people that the rightful king of the world against whom they have rebelled is willing to grant amnesty to all who return and live under his rule. Jesus Christ, the son of David, the eternal king of the world, will come from heaven and establish a reign of joy and righteousness and peace over all his loyal subjects forever and ever. And until he comes, the worldwide mission of the church is to extend complete, free, universal amnesty to people of every nation. That's our mission. That's what we're called to do, is just tell people out here starving to death, living in a dark, cold kingdom, there is a better kingdom over here. And the king is Jesus Christ, Lord of Lords. I'm just reading from his message. He says, I close with an invitation for you to make God's covenant with David a covenant with you. It's not just my invitation, it's God's. Isaiah 55, 1, 1 through 3. The point of this invitation is that the very sovereignty and wisdom and love of God, which assured David of an eternal kingdom, can also assure you of God's eternal kingdom, uh, 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 eternal kindness as a part of that king kingdom. Isaiah writes, Come. I counted them five times he's going to say this. Listen to this. Come. Everyone who thirst, come. Come to the waters. And who, he who has no money, come. Buy and eat, come. Buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good. And delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant. My steadfast, sure love for David. That's the prophet Isaiah writing the words of God to the people of Israel. Saying, just come. Just come. Just come. If you'll just come, you can come from that darkness, that kingdom of darkness, into a kingdom of life and blessings. The very mercy and faithfulness that guarantees David an eternal kingdom can guarantee you all the joy and righteousness and peace of that kingdom. God is saying to you this morning, if you will come, if you'll come to me empty-handed and hungry, willing to receive what I give, then I will write for myself in your presence a job description and bind myself with an oath to treat you forever with the same mercy and faithfulness that I have demonstrated in my covenant with David. That one paragraph is worth all the reading this morning. The covenant that God is willing to make with us is just as binding and it's a covenant forever that he wants to do good by me. He wants me to have everlasting life. He wants me to have life now, life forever, a life of blessing. And what he says, if you'll come to me this morning empty-handed, you can't come in and start bragging about what you've done and, and who you are and, 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 and all of that. You come empty-handed and hungry eager, willing to receive what I give, and I personally will write a job description down, a covenant, and sign it in my own blood. I'd say that would be a pretty permanent kind of a covenant or a contract this morning, that Christ is willing with his own blood to seal mine and your destiny eternally. And then the Bible closes, the last few verses of the Bible closes with Jesus himself saying, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Let him who is thirsty, what? Let him who is thirsty come. Jesus is still saying, come. 
to all the world come. Let him who desires take the water of life without price come. As Jesus did say, the broad way that leads to hell is wide and the narrow gate that leads to heaven is, is narrow. And in saying that, what he means is all the world's invited, but all the world can't come any way they want to. All the world is invited, but all the world comes by way of Jesus Christ. Many of you have been to air, airport terminals, and as you're coming out of the terminal, and the one in DFW and O'Hare that I'm familiar with, they'd have like 30 booths out there. And I just got the thought that if they hung one booth, one, one terminal up there that said, this is the way to heaven, it wouldn't matter how many other ways there were. If you wasn't willing to get in line and go that one way, you wasn't going to heaven, if you understand the illustration. That's what Jesus is saying. All the world can come, but you don't come one way. You don't come through one booth, one gate, and that being the blood of Jesus Christ shed on a cross for you and I. When we come to the Son of David, we come to the King of Kings. He will sign not with pen and ink, but with his own blood, our personal copy of the job description he has written for himself to be God to you, to be your God, your Lord, your Savior, your Redeemer, and he will give you an eternal covenant never to turn away from doing you good. Now, that's quite a covenant this morning. We don't come to God from what we can bring to him. We have nothing to bring to him. But we come to God based on his own covenant, based on his own word. This is what you said, God. I am claiming your precious grace this morning that you said that you did that you'll deliver that you'll keep your promise that forever and ever and ever the blood of jesus christ is able is efficient is capable of forgiving my sins that i might live in heaven with a holy god so the covenants this morning are vastly important when God makes covenants, he keeps them. And he's made a new covenant. And that is that if you'll turn away from that dark kingdom and you'll turn into the face of a, of a uh, holy God and a new kingdom and you realize that, as David said, who am I? I am nothing, nobody to deserve the grace that you bestowed on me. And then we can fall on our face before him and just worship him and thank him for all that he's done. Miss Fran, would you come to the piano and just uh, play this morning? We'll ask you to 